start i mean like it's already 15 minutes so we'll start it Welcome everyone. Welcome to IDT internships with uh, AppShay, run by an industry partner, Blackbox. So I just want to give a small introduction about uh, I International Institute of Digital Technology, uh, which is founded by uh, Government of Andhra Pradesh. It is established. It is the first premier digital institution established by Government of Andhra Pradesh, Tirupati, to nurture high quality digital talent in Andhra Pradesh. So and also. Uh, industry partnered with Blackbugs, where Blackbugs is started in 2013 with the aim of creating a great ecosystem of academia, research, industry, and individuals. Blackbugs is a premier partner to government of AP and Telangana and the uh, IITs and JNTUs. And it also conducted um, faculty development programs for more than 70, 76,000 faculties also across India and also train 1,22,000 students. And in this uh, session, we have uh, Anuradha Dota, who is the CEO and founder of uh, Blackbugs, and also uh, program director Dinesh Kumar, who is the program director of IIDT. With this program, we encourage every intern to be active and attentive during the training program. Uh, where the pro project oriented training will be giving to you the industry approach on uh, AI ML data science. We wish you all the best in the program and we look forward for the uh, successful internship. I would like to uh, Anradha Tota ma'am to speak few words. Hello, students. Uh, um, so it's great meeting you all once again. I'm sure I have met you quite some time back. Also, you know, every person I might have met sometime or the other in your college or on a session or so. So great to meet you uh, once again. And thanks for choosing IDT Black Box for your internship. Would like to mention a couple of things. One is, uh, you know, compared to all other uh, internship programs, you have chosen, you might have chosen. Uh, there is one great difference between this program and the other program, which is like, this is a live program. At least 50 hours will be taken live by instructors who are uh, heading uh, um, in major companies uh, that, to the head of CXO levels. So that level of people will be giving you live sessions. That's difference number one. Difference number two is there will be mentors for each of each one of you, there will be a mentor. They'll make they'll make a group for you, WhatsApp group for you, and uh, take care of all your issues, whatever issue you get operationally, technically, you're not able to understand something. Somebody is there always to answer your queries. That's difference number two. Difference major difference number three is nobody is offering a project. So this pro program, what we believe is. Just listening to a video, there are hundreds and thousands of videos in the internet. doesn't help you. You have to practically do a project. And usually what is happening is 
internship is treated differently and project is different uh, treated differently so a student has to spend twice pay for internship and pay for project which is even more higher some 3000 4000 rupees this program the most important difference is that it also makes you complete a project so it is one arrow two birds you have one program which will give you internship which will also give project and as for how you do the project how you learn these three important differences you know and you spread the word to all your friends and also juniors who have to do their third year projects so spread this uh, information to all your friends so these three important differences i told you but what happens uh, uh, to your learning is more important. We will teach you better. We will put mentors. We will do all things that is to be needed by a very good program. We will do be doing that. But how you learn is it is dependent on you. Even if, if I bring uh, the best of the world to teach you, how much you take and how much you do is only difference that makes to your learning. Right? So after your degree, after your graduation in BTEC, many of you will go and join courses. If you haven't got any job yet, many of you will go and join courses. If you do this course properly, there is no need to join any other course because even those people will not give you a job. If you do this course properly, you don't need to spend 30 to 40,000 for another course in Amirpet or so. This is exactly the, such a course which will give you all that is required by a good course. Okay, so most important thing is complete whatever assignment is given. Learn and uh, complete those quizzes, exams and test yourself at many, many points. There are also employability classes. Attend those things and equip yourself completely for jobs. You all must be knowing the job market is really, really very bad. So you will have to prepare the, your best. Give your best. If somebody else is preparing 50%, you have to prepare 100%. If somebody is putting 50 hours, you have to put 100 hours. Prepare your best. So all that is needed will be provided in this. How much you can take depends on you. Okay. So that is about this program and they will be making you WhatsApp groups and uh, give you various ways of finding help if you have any issues not only whatsapp group there will be a number there will be customer support whatsapp you can personally whatsapp them they will also put you in a social network which is a black Buck exclusive social network there are number of ways you reach out to us in case you have an issue reaching out to us learning is on you our side we will do our 100 percent okay so all the best to all of you um, already one more thing I want to tell is uh, I, I spoke for five minutes, but it is 47, 647. That means we were waiting for people for almost 15 minutes. You are, you are, uh, sp uh, you are wasting time of thousand people because thousand people are learning on this. You are wasting time of thousand people. If you are joining late and we are waiting for you, you will have to remember that. And please join this on time, be disciplined, learn and do the exercises as told. Every day if you make a log, you don't need to slog last final day to complete uh, 500 days logs. Every day keep writing logs uh, in the last day. All those you can avoid if you do whatever they ask you to do every day. Okay, because that also they have automated. Writing your log also they have automated. A lot of things are automated and lot of things you don't need to do. Just follow what people are saying. Okay. So all the best to all of you. And we want to see great projects coming out of this and great learning to all of you. And uh, we want all of you to be equipped so very well than rest of the others in, when you are moving into the job market. Thank you so much and all the best. I request Dinesh Reddy, sir, who is the program director, to tell about the curriculum and how this will be uh, useful to them. Good, uh, good evening, all. Uh, I am Dinesh, uh, representing IADT. And uh, welcome to you all for the virtual internship program of AIML. As uh, my brother, madam, told, 
you do not waste time on spending on unnecessary things and we request you to follow the class as per the schedule given by our our mentors or our team and uh, hopefully it is already made as told it is already 20 minutes uh, completed of the session what we are supposed to do and uh, all the best you carry on with the class manasi uh, let the instructor take the session as uh, i could not speak much about this sure sir sure so here yeah. we have the industry instructor who is the rudra joshi who is having more than 3 years of experience and uh, training the students and also the faculty so i request rudra uh, sir to take over the session yes am i audible everyone yes ma'am am i audible yeah you are audible you are audible you are audible yes sir so we'll just start with the session now yeah. before yeah. that i mean yeah let's give me a um, sound check is my audio fine yes audio yeah, is my video you are good Yeah, right. Okay, yeah. So yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, hope you guys are energized for the session. So we'll be having a orientation today about from I mean the technical ideas that we'll go through. So the basic idea of today's lecture is going to be having an I mean uh a bird's eye view of what are we going to cover in the forthcoming training sessions and how are we going to use that in um as in order to get. up to speed with the projects so the training is something that will be like a, a hand holding for you guys to be able to step on and start with your projects because i mean one thing that i truly believe in before just we uh, start i mean just i have this some lines of motivation that you can maybe make use of that i mean we at the day first itself may or may not be aware of the day, i mean the project that we are going to have so right now what we have is an i mean uh, a, con a concept of ideation that we are going to have so the ideation is going to be of a foundation for getting started on the project and then as in when like when you let's say trying to navigate to some place which is going to trying to go to uh, let's say she she said and for that you need to take the first step so where first step as in when you take towards uh, she said him you will be able to figure out that okay this is the right step i mean this is the wrong step and based on your i mean rectification that that you make on those bases and like how do you actually uh, start traveling based on that your trajectory of your um like this of your navigation will be able to progress and based on how we take any um uh, more steps forward you will be able to up until um like you have an idea of where you are going you will be just uh, following your uh, navigation blindly but once you are able to get some sense of where you are heading then the direction becomes clear and that's when you are starting to gain more confidence with regards to your skills of navigation how do you actually reach she she said them and in uh, like no time you'll be able to reach there within like <clears throat> two to four hours of leaving from hyderabad so i'm just giving an example so the idea is that you should have like just a clear direction that we are going to progress in and these sessions are going to be just that you are going to have like idea of what we are going to do in the project and based on that i mean uh, concept that you are going to learn we'll be able to execute them in real time when we come to project building so with that in mind i'll just like to uh, first run you through the syllabus and give you a quick overview of what we are going to cover and then we'll just start with getting our hands on with python in first session so before that just give me a quick um check as to are you able to see my screen is the syllabus visible to you clearly yeah hopefully the syllabus is clearly visible so this is going to be our tentative syllabus for i mean how we are going to move from day first so on the right hand side column we have the a day wise segregation of like what we are going to cover in each day and on the left hand side you are going to see the units that we are going to cover so in today's lecture i mean session we'll just be going through a introduction of python data types basic data structures and loops and control for statements then upcoming days we'll be seeing about functions and like more in depth um inbuilt python libraries like math and it tools then we'll be going through the of uh, like file handling and file comprehension me mechanism that python offers that must have been like, covered in other languages as well as java if you go to some other con uh, like um, different types of training then we'll come to what are pickle files what are basically what are the dot pkl files and how are they going to be used for creating machine learning models what is exceptional handling how do you go about like using try catch and exit and finally all of those things 
then we'll come to the day four we'll be having like oops and basic uh overview of how does object oriented programming work what are the advantages how is it how is it actually helping create optimized code then we'll come to python libraries like numpy then uh, as and when we progress from numpy we'll be coming to actually creating data frames and how do you data frame i mean you work with data frames with the help of pandas library then we'll be moving to core data science concepts like eda which is like exploited data analysis then scraping wherein basically you crawl the data from different websites and you bring them together with the help of these libraries like selenium beautiful soup and requests then after we have an idea of how data processing happens in python with the help of pandas we'll come to the part where we actually work on statistics so we'll be working on first i mean two different kinds of statistics that is first is the descriptive statistics and the second is the inferential statistics so in the descriptive part we'll be going towards mean median mode apart from that we'll be coming towards the central tendency going towards more in depth about like um, what are these tests meaning then we'll come to the inferential part which is like having an idea about confidence interval central logic theorem hypothesis testing how does testing occur in like a critical scenarios then we'll come to what is different types of tests t test z test um like then we'll come to binomial distribution how are we going to actually use binomial distribution in different types of distributions in our actual practical data science journey then we'll be coming towards databases which is going to be your backbone of all the data set that you're going to use so we'll be learning about data sets uh, i mean databases uh, how are we actually connecting databases with the help of python what are different kinds of these database um wrappers that we're using mysql and sql like this uh, for these frameworks then we'll be coming to the core part of our course which is going to be on machine learning so in machine learning we'll be having first an intuition of what all these concepts are what is feature engineering what is like, encodings what are different types of en encodings how are actually this um like uh, features going to be transformed what are we going to do with the help of these um like different kinds of uh, like functions that we're using so like log loss functions or what are different kinds of uh, profit and cost functions then we'll come to how to actually measure or act measure of accuracy which is called as evaluation metrics which is going to be how is our model performing in real time then we'll come to the different algorithms which is going to be in and around the classification and regression algorithms which are basically the chunks of machine learning then we'll come to tuning so basically hyperparameter tuning as to how do you have a ready-made model but you actually go from using that for let's say like chat gpt for let's say your exam answers or let's say you want to have like cooking with the help of chat gpt how do you find tune it on your own data set that is what we'll come to understand in the like hyperparameter tuning then we'll come to different libraries actually earlier we'll have the intuition then we'll come to the practical execution with the help of sk learn and different other libraries like um um tensorflow and all then we'll come to the more um like optimization part which is the underfit how do you actually reduce underfitting and overfitting and we will come to know actually based on our hyperparameter tuning how do we choose an algorithm on what data, data type so i mean you must have heard about different types of algorithms like what is the linear regression what is heuristic regression how do you actually categorize and choose one over the other that is what we are going to see based on our <clears throat> understanding of the machine learning approaches then these were all the approaches of um supervised learning then we we'll come to the unsupervised learning based algorithms so we're going to be a clustering algorithm your different types of density based clustering all of your seven clustering types you might have come across then we'll be coming to different kinds of optimization and unsupervised learning also what exactly is uh, is it um, going to do when we actually say what is dimensional reduction we'll come to different kinds of dimensional reduction what is principal component analysis which is pca what is sign cost analysis sne we will come to what is actually going to happen when we are trying to program a game which is basically a concept of reinforcement learning and then as and when we'll move forward before we move towards deep learning we'll be having an idea of what is semi supervised learning how do we actually refer to nlp as a kind of semi supervised learning so this is what i'll leave you with a caveat before we answer it when we come to semi supervised learning and then we'll come to how you actually go about building data types and how do you actually go about building data pipelines in terms of using these uh, data from one end and giving like i mean as taking batch data from one end and giving a stream uh like <clears throat> stream data to the other, other part so this will help us when we see when you build projects like netflix or let's say building a clone of some other ott platform this is when you will be using pipelines for a lot of processing then after moving through machine learning uh, and learning about unsupervised learning we'll be moving and we'll be taking our step a notch higher by learning about what is deep learning so in deep learning we'll be covering 
what are activation functions, what are neural networks going to be used, how you actually go about creating a neural network from scratch, what are the different concepts of neural network, what is batch size, what is epoch, what is learning rate, how do you actually um, make, select an ideal batch size, what are going to be your parameters when you're learning about a model, or when you are going to figure out which actually um, neural network architecture is better for you. Is the RNN better, a CNN better, or is the a, I mean, a, just a plain vanilla ANN better for you? That is what we will figure out as we move towards the deep learning part. Then, like we had in the hyperparameter tuning in the supervised and supervised learning, here also we'll be having the um, like idea of what is hyperparameter tuning, how do you actually use it in the neural network um, space, and why do we use certain like neural network approaches in certain scenarios. So, like, just to give you an idea, why is RNN used more in text pre-processing and CNN is used more in computer vision? That is what we'll, we'll answer when we move towards what are these different kinds of neural network architectures. Then we'll be coming towards propagation metrics. So, I mean, what is feed for neural network or what is back propagation neural network? So, all of those will be covering in the uh, like these propagation based like, sessions. We'll be coming then towards the uh, like towards the half time of our session, we'll be coming towards what is gradient, um, like gradient gradient problems and how do you solve gradient problems for actually getting rid of overfitting and underfitting. Then we'll be again having to regularize or normalize them with the help of your regularization techniques that we'll be covering. So by then we'll be have a uh, 50% of our course session done. So that would be a good time to start with like now deployment. So we'll be starting with deployment in terms of we'll be coming to different deployment um like like tools like GitHub or like we'll be using CI CD for some I mean certain understandings. So we'll be coming towards GitHub. We'll be before that understanding what is Git, what is version controlling, how do you actually use version controlling in a live project, and how do industries I mean in companies use version controlling for their maximum productivity. Then we'll be coming to this different kinds of deployment frameworks in Python, which is Streamlit, Flask, and Django. So all of these are going to be your deployment or like your application deployment um, frameworks. We'll be then again taking a step higher with frame with machine learning and deep learning frameworks that are based not only on our local system, but we are going to take it a notch higher and learn about what is different kinds of um, MLOps like applications, which is like PyTorch or TensorFlow or Keras. As in when, I mean, we'll be coming to them, we'll be exploring each of them in depth and how are those actually going to help us in due course of our project? Then, of course, we'll be coming to this op optical character recognition, which is OCR based engine, which is Keras OCR for like pre processing and building like uh, computer vision models. We'll be then <coughs> working ourselves with an, I mean, a practical ANN, I mean, uh, in, uh, which is artificial neural network based model, and learning about how do we actually save a H5 or a pickle file that we learned about. In the day two, then we'll be coming to using Google Colab, which is just another Jupyter notebook, but working on like Google Cloud, which is basically going to help us working with uh, GCP or Google uh, Cloud platform better for our processes. Then again, we'll be going towards a lot of Kaggle notebooks to have an in-depth understanding of what all different kinds of machine learning um, practitioners have already worked with. Then we'll be coming to these um, accuracy metrics, which are going to be how do you actually categorize loss function? What are these loss function basically responsible for? And how are they actually going to use our models for their, I mean, fine tuning? Once we have that, we'll be coming to computer vision. So computer vision is going to be our, um, one of the major highlights of the course, because that is what many of you guys will be use, will be using for your projects, if, I mean, for, internship. So we'll be going in depth about computer vision. So make sure you attend these in sessions without fail. Then in computer vision itself in, in CNN, we'll be going through a lot of these um, computer vision concepts that are going to be centered around your, I mean, how do you actually create data? I mean, how do you actually segregate and process image data before actually clicking it forward and pre-processing it? So you have like, a, uh, let's say a sign, you have like one lakh or like hundred thousand signed documents with you. How do you predict this sign is of which user? So for that, we'll be using first uh, an OCR engine that is going to take your sign and convert it into text. And then based on the text, we'll be connecting a label, I mean a labeled box, which is going to be your this. You have to label your data 
after you have bounding box ready, based on the bounding box, you'll be able to get a clear picture as to okay, this is a, uh, whose signature is this. So that comes under handwriting or signature detection. That is going to be again a CNN based application that we are going to see. So all of these concepts of like pixeling, regularization, digitalization, sampling, all of those things are going to be a part of our CNN based project. Then of course, we'll be coming to a lot of these pixelation and all of these, if, if you have done image editing or video editing in the past, You'll be, reading, you'll be understanding a lot of these functions much better about color adjustments, what is blurring, how do you noise remove, and how do you implement, I mean, uh, let's say, BW or background and white filter, how do you, let's say, reforce a color, all of those will be coming in detail. Then we'll be coming to a lot of these CNN libraries, which is going to be used like TensorFlow and Keras, which we already um, I mean, understood before. We'll be seeing how, how those functions are used particularly for using CV for various libraries like OpenCV or like other some um, computation libraries. Then we'll be seeing in depth about these models. I mean, first we have an idea of how do you go about creating a computer vision, like a CNN based architecture, then we'll be coming to practically using them. And how do you actually use pre-trained models? Because once we have a like a foundation ready of the, all these concepts, we'll be not focusing on creating each model from scratch. We'll be using the existing foundation that we have and build on top of that with the use of pre-trained libraries or pre-trained modules. So we'll be seeing that. And up until, I mean, af after we finish the syllabus, we'll be, I'll be taking on questions. So I see Nagavamsi, you have got out. I'll be covering that once I have sit, run through, through the syllabus. So after the main transfer learning, we'll be coming to a lot of um, cases where we'll be seeing case studies of how CNN architecture has been used by different companies like Meta and like, Apple, how do actually they use CNN for the betterment of their products? Then again, we'll be coming to a lot of I mean, handling of overfitting and underfitting and regularization. I mean, and finally, we'll come into OCR again. Finally, all after that, we'll be coming to image classification, which is a I mean, a similar topic as we I mean, as computer vision, but it has a distinction that it is not only working on um activation of image, but also working on classification of image. So we'll be covering that. What are the different concepts? How do you actually classify a video? What is video analytics going to be used for? Then of course, the example that I gave you the signature detection, it is an example of object detection. So if you must have seen like um, this, all these, uh, I mean, these models like ExcelNet and the first the first computer model that were coming were all basically object detection models. So in that we'll be covering bounding, box regress and all of those different kinds of concepts. Then all of these parameters, which is these are model models. IOU is intersection or union model. Then YOLO is basically you only look once, which is again a computer vision model. And finally you have SSD explanation, which is stochastic standard descent. We'll be coming diamond in detail. Then we'll be seeing what is statistic. I mean, uh, what are different kinds of segmentation. One is syntactical segmentation and second is a semantic segmentation. We'll be coming to them. What are Excel net? What is U net? What are these uh, mobile net? And I mean, all of these network based models. We're coming to them. And then finally, we'll be, we'll be covering a concept which is called Siamese network, which will be like Siamese twins. If you have heard about them, it is based on the similar concept. And we'll see when we come to that. And then we'll have a look at most recent AI library, which is called fast.ai. That is going to be our, I mean, use primary use for. CN based models or like of like or other re retrofit CNN model, which is RCNN and faster RCNN and basically faster R again RCN, which is going to be a like similar sounding name, but they have a very different functionality from each other. So we'll be seeing them. After we have image classification and computer vision done, we'll be moving through NLP. So NLP, as I earlier mentioned, also this is a, a kind of semi-supervised learning. We'll be going through that in detail in our I mean NLP model towards the third week of our session. So we'll be coming to a lot of basic concepts first. That is tokenization. What is bag of words? What is um like stop words? How are we actually using normalization in that? All of those things we'll be covering. Then we'll be coming through what is a stemma, which is basically, I mean, if you see a leaf also, a leaf has a stem and a lemma. So this the stem is a bottle, I mean, is the central part in the leaf that runs through the edges of the leaf. And the lemma is the kind of roots that go throughout the uh, throughout the leaf from the center towards the periphery or towards the corners. Those are called lemmas. So in the same way, when you speak of a word, let's say um, is training. Out of the training word, the train part is a stem 
and the ing is the extra part so the stem is the uh, train part and the ing is the extra part so we'll be removing that those stop i mean the extra part out and the point that is left the train is referred to as a stem then lemma is similarly i mean this concept is sounding similar but in the case of training when you take let's say um let's say you take a word like stationary okay then stationary the station part is going to be a lemma because the word station has a different meaning entirely than stationary so we'll be coming to that in detail but i mean just for the reference i gave you an example so they'll be coming that in detail and after the streaming lemmatization we'll come to like these different kinds of pre processing techniques in nlp which is one encoding parts which is what, which is what is one what encoding which is what is that um zero shot encoding we'll be coming to all of that in detail they're using different kinds of application which is a, what is a bag of words what is tfidf which basically means term frequency inverse de uh, dependent frequency we'll be coming that in detail and we'll, when, then we'll be seeing what is n grams we'll be also referring to a lot of Model theory, which are using n grams, we'll be using a uh, monogram, bigrams, trigrams, and again, ultimately, we'll be landing up at n, n grams. Then, after that, we'll be moving to these different kinds of NLTK based, which is like again a natural language toolkit based models. We'll be seeing them in detail, we'll be seeing how those implementation occurs in recommendation systems. So, like Netflix, if you see, is using a recommendation system to give you a recommended set of movies that you're likely to watch after, let's say, you watch Animal. Which are movies are you going to watch after that? Is what is Netflix recommendation engine teaching you by the time you are actually watching the movie? So it identifies your preferences and it looks at what you are going to like to watch next, which is what it recommends in the recommendation engine. Then we'll be coming to what is word embedding. So word embedding basically it means that your word is assigned a vector value. It is your word is converted from a text or let's say a string into an integer or a, or a number. That is what we'll be having to know in the, I mean, word embedding kind of sessions. We'll be using different kinds of libraries like word, word to vec glove, and all of these different kinds of, um, let's say, uh, spaces also another kind of word embedding library. Those are the word libraries we'll be using. And what is POS, what is part of speech? We must have heard about part of speech in English while we're learning. What is it actually going to mean part of speech in terms of Natural language processing in terms of word embeddings that we'll be seeing. What is tagging actually uh, means in the case of part of speech? Then we'll be coming to a concept which is NER, which is a very interesting concept called name entity recognition, which is basically your name is assigned some key value such that, let's say if I send a sentence, so it is ice cream. And out of that, the this is part gets stopped. I mean, it gets removed. But the ice cream part gets I mean, some important because of the value that it, it comes. So the ice cream, this is an ice cream uh, word is coming. And let's say this ice creams are useless. So basically, the, I mean, in this ice, creams are useless. If I say this word, then the this, the ice cream word in the first sentence and, the, the, and the, this ice creams are useless. So the ice cream in that second sentence and the first sentence is very different. So these two differences are going to be what we are going to uh, uh, we are going to describe and learn how are they handled in machine learning models with the help of NER, which is natural language, which is a named entity recognition. And after that, we'll be using these NER based approaches for RN, which is again, I mean, where we are mentioned is is a, I mean, recurrent neural networks. We'll be seeing that how RN, how NER is used in that. Then all of these the complex models will be coming to know, which is what is LSTM, which is long short term models. All of those are transformer based models, which we should be going to see. And these transformer based models are basically what are ruling the world right now. So any, any model you have, like, like a chat GPT, or let's say Dolly, or these um, Google Bard, all of those being being AI, all of those are nothing but transformer based models are going to be like using LLM or large language models on the basis of on the backend side. So all of these are example of word embedding based models will be coming to that. And after that, we'll be using in depth use cases which is like twitter sentiment analysis or let's say our uh, sentiment analysis of let's say reddit data all of those will be seeing in practical with the help of spacey library after we have nlp code we'll be, we'll be moving to time series analysis which is basically your time series data is like a data which is not occurring over, over a span of one time period is occurring at the same time on different occasions or on different dates that comes under time series analysis 
so we'll be coming to that towards the end of our sessions so in time series analysis we'll be, we'll be going through a lot of i mean time related concepts which is arima less uh, left arima right arima all of those things and we'll be covering finally our ml ops which is going to be in terms of using <clears throat> various deploy i mean your ml ops based algorithm which is going to be using let's say spark or um hadoop for your i mean production level settings then once we have that in mind we'll be coming to a lot of these like first project um conclusion levels so how are we going to actually decide on which project to do and how are we going to chart our like timelines for projects and how are we going to conclude our understanding and use them forward for creating projects that is what we will be seeing with the help of i mean these project level understanding so we'll be using certain project examples and we'll, i'll be showing you how these projects are going to be working in real time and how you can take references from them and use them for your own set of projects that you're going to work so then we'll be coming first to machine learning based project then we'll come to deep learning and computer vision based projects wherein let's say if i am going to give you like a hook or like a thing to remember for that project let's say how are we going to use how are we going to create smart classes or i'm going to show you what applications i have developed as projects of mine so how you can use smart classes like these for actually going about creating let's say a virtual augmented reality kind of uh, application how can you do that how can you have telemedicine that is i mean a doctor is wearing these glasses and how can he i mean uh, test you or basically give you a prescription only by looking at these glasses nothing else i will be seeing that in as a project on the like on last days of your sessions and finally we'll be using it i mean our nlp based project that is basically if i were to again give you a clean like a hint or like a sneak peek into what we're going to do in the nlp project so i'll give you a project i'll just give you my example which is i'll be using an project called idea which is our intelligent document extraction algorithm i'll be showing you that live and how do i work on creating these nlp projects now what does it do how do i recognize a sign how do i actually get the other data for someone who is trying to mess with my other details so that will be seen in the nlp based projects so with that we'll be coming to the end of the sessions and with that i mean i will be finally focusing more on projects and seeing you guys create awesome projects and coming back with all of these things that you have learned in the sessions and how do you actually use about creating a project that is all we'll be seeing throughout the course now i guess some of you had some queries so you can ask me right now or else i'll be starting with the content that we have planned for today yes once you heard it out right Yeah, Vamsi, are you there? Yes, anybody who has a doubt can please, uh, I'll just unmute you and you can ask your query. Yes. Yeah, please raise your hand in case you have a doubt. I'm unable to find through the Zoom screen. I guess Vamsi Krishna had a doubt. In case it's not a doubt, I mean, I'll just move forward with the uh, actual course content. Okay, I'm assuming there's no doubt. If there's any doubt you have, you can um, ask me after the lecture and I'll be able to help you. Yes, so we'll just start with the first parts of your... Yes, I think um, this Vamsi is back, yeah. Yeah, Vamsi, I've asked you to unmute you. You can unmute yourself and ask the query. Sir, I, can I get the Silver Paper PDF as PDF? Yeah, sure, sure. I'll be sending the PDF. Okay, sir. That's it. Okay, that's all? That's it, sir. Yeah, that's a short. I mean, I'll be sharing all of my resources that I have uh, without okay. any hesitation to which, I mean, you guys. Like, I'll be helping my, I mean, your guys as much as possible from my end. And if you still, I mean, feel like there is some thing that I need should, that I should I should focus more on. I should maybe I mean bring out something else. I mean that you might have like seen from my resources that you have that, that I have not shared it. You can freely ask me for that and I'll be sharing without any hesitation. My idea is to help you as much as possible and happily like just uh, step forward and get you guys to the projects so that you get have like uh, initial confidence that you require for moving and like um, towards brighter 
um, ideas and windows better career opportunities that's what my idea about this entire session is okay sir thank yeah. you ठीक है, I'll share you the address. I mean, and the, I mean, resources also after we complete the session. Okay, okay thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you, Samji. Thank you. All right. So I hope you guys can see my screen. So I mean, the first day is going to be a little light, and it's going to be a revision that if you guys, you guys might have already covered, but it's an essay just to get others to the same speed that you, some of you guys might have. But I think this is just a basic introduction of Python. That I mean, if some of you guys are actually Looking at Python for the first time, then we should be able to figure out what Python is used for. How are we actually going to use it in machine learning applications? So we'll be doing like going from zero, from scratch to creating like own multiple machine learning projects in the span of these uh, sessions. So that just to give you some some trivia, which is how is I mean how was Python created? What was it used for? So this is a slide that is going to solve that purpose. So Python is basically a high level programming language that is going to use C underneath it. For being able to create digital general purpose programs, the idea that Python was created with was that it should be able to. I mean, even a five-year-old should be able to read it. That's what the idea of Python creation was. That anybody who does not have an idea of what programming is, what computer science engineering is, what in general coding is, should be able to figure out looking at a statement. What is this statement going to do? That's the idea of creating. I mean, creating. I mean, had had a Python. By Gudeman and Rossum, so you see, it's like a like nineteen eighties language. It's all I mean, our thirty five year old language. Still, we are using it for the sake of its simplicity and its rapid development in terms of developer community. So that comes to by the use of Python in general purpose programming. Then, what do I mean by general purpose of programming? The idea is that right from creating a simple app like a to do list or like a hello world app. From there, up until using these Python libraries to going about creating these all Mars rovers or Sunderland three space mission. From this to do list to getting these space exploration missions, both of them can be done with the help of using Python. Just because of this wide range of projects that you can be able to do with Python, we have Python as a general purpose programming that can be used for creating like um web application using Python. You can create Machine learning application, you can of course create these simple full stack applications. You can use different libraries like Django can be used for creating full stack applications. Machine learning applications can be created with the help of TensorFlow or uh, Sci SciPy. Then you can use this and uh, beautiful dashboard visualization that you see or beautiful report that you see with the help of like <clears throat> Tableau or integration of Python with Power BI or those applications. The idea of using Python for any each and every or Programming um, use case or requirement is what makes Python a general purpose programming language. Then, what does it mean when I say Python is an interpreted language? So the idea is that generally, what happens is your any other programming language like like C or let's say C plus plus, all of those programming language are base programming language or low level programming language. What that means basically is that once you have your code written in C. Let's say I have a, a simple hello world code written in C, which is going to actually just print hello world. Then once I have that print hello world program written in C, that is print f hello world and inverted commas close semicolon. Once I have that, what it does is that the first the C the C compiler or the GCC compiler is going to take in your uh, code as a prompt as an input. Then what it is going to do is it going to come. Pile the GCC compiler is going to compile your code into a C based program, and once the compilation is started, what happens is it breaks down each of your segments or each of your like printf statement into lower level language, which is basically going to be broken down into byte code. And once it is broken into byte code, it is then going to be processed into a stream of zeros and ones. So by default, if I were to ask you that what does a computer understand? You would say, I mean, anybody likely would, would say that it is used to, to, I mean, the computer is used to learning only in zeros and ones. What I mean, that's supposed to be what we are taught, right? But the this idea also has flaws in it. The fact is that computer does not even understand zeros and ones. Computer only only understands voltage difference. So computer only comes to know what is a high voltage and what is a low voltage. So this low voltage is what we refer to as a zero. 
and this higher voltage is basically what we refer to as one. So, I mean, uh, let's say if it's not even like uh, there's, there's a low voltage and there's a high voltage, there's a, there's a threshold of voltage. So, let's say that there's a uh, signal coming of 10 volts and that is the maximum. So, if I get a signal which is, which is reaching 10 volts, then that is a maximum that, that is going to be a one. But if I get any signal which is less than 10 volt, be it 9.99 or be it 0 0.01, both of those voltages are going to be considered by the computer as a zero or like a low voltage. So computer only understands this stream of zero and one with the help of these different kinds of voltage differences. So I mean, this is for your reference, I told about this low voltages, but just to have an idea, okay, computer only gets two things, which is zeros and ones. So a basic C level program of hello world gets converted by a compiler with the um, different kinds of compiler settings, and like, which is then in your CPU. And it ultimately comes down to boiling your code to zero and one. So this is what a C language or like a C programming language does. But the whole process of compilation from your uh, C code to let's say byte code with the help of compiler and from byte code to stream of zeros and ones, this takes a long amount of time. So I mean, it also takes a lot of effort from the developer to go about learn learning about not only your C language. If I want to learn C language, I don't have to have learn about C language. I have to learn about a lot of these peripheral concepts or not so important concepts like what is pointer, what is memory optimization, what is mem like what do you actually mean by memory assignments? What are the streams? What are these buses? What are these storage level restrictions? What are the CPU? I have to need to go about OS, and finally, I also need to learn about computer organization architecture. So all of this has a heavy like headache for any developer who is actually just doing a front end logic. If I only, only want, to, want to change a button, I don't need to learn about all the 300 years of history of computer science. Instead, what I can do is what interpreted languages do. So languages like Python, which is an interpreted language, like JavaScript, which is again an interpreted language. What all these languages do is that it converts all of your Python level code into not only not directly into C, but it actually converts your Python code into uh, lower level languages, that is, First and foremost, about only and only um, converting your Python code into C code. That's the whole job of Python. Okay. It only converts your Python level code into C. That's all you need to know. And so you are suddenly focus shifts not only from doing all the more um these peripheral or these not, not important things like going about learning about compilers and going about learning about OS and all of those stuff. Your focus is only and only limited to learning about what is Python, how is Python used, and then you can focus on much important tasks like what is machine learning, what is deep learning, and you can learn more about that in place of learning about all these boring kinds of OS and different compiler based models and all of those things. So that's what Python is beautiful for, that it has interpretation of being an easy language and that's what you have to focus on, nothing else. That's what we are going to learn about in Python. So we it's, Python has a lot of these high level data structures that we are going to learn about. So you can use Python for not only storing these small little um, like a list tuple and dictionary, but you can take it higher and store kinds of these complex data structures. Like let's say you want to store heaps, you can do it in Python. You want to store data spaces, you can store it in Python. You want to store data frames, you can do it in Python. Up until you want to even store vector database, which is like basically used for these chat GPT level applications or GPT four level applications. All of those also you can be doing in Python only with the help of using plain vanilla libraries. We'll be seeing that also. So the, the point that I'm trying to convey is that Python has a lot of these features that are going to be unparalleled in, in, in any of our languages. It's about just uh, some of the features of that. So it's like an easy to use language and not be going to do much details so we can be able to um, give just, just in the interest of time. So we'll be going through like a lot of these features that are going to be there. It's a very expressive language. It's a very fast language because of its, it's because of its nature of learning rate is going to be very uh, fast and so you can implement it way and way forward which if each which each of its increasing the speed then it's an interpreted language basically means that you don't have to worry about the bottom level low, uh, the lower level concepts of the word OS and uh, compiler and all of this you can only focus all your uh, energies on your learning of Python and machine learning so about that and then finally we have like a idea of Python being a cross-platform language which is, which is can use Python on Windows, Mac or I mean uh, or a Linux system. But by default, 
Mac and Windows, I'm sorry, Mac and um, Linux based distributions like Ubuntu or like Mac OS, all of those are having default Python installed. So you don't have to worry about, um, have to worry about all of these um, installation with, with, with these um, OSs like when, with Mac OS and Ubuntu. You can directly just use Python by install, I mean, by just calling Python 3.0 and you can start working on it right away. But in Windows, you have to, of course, install Python, which I'll be showing you in some time. How do you install Python and how do you actually work about using Python interpreter in that? There's a link about that. And of course, Python is an open source, so you don't have to take any permission for using Python. You don't have to go to ask Goodwin or awesome about using Python. You don't have to take permission from him. So that's what makes it easier and learned um, like in the span of whatever time we have. It's an easier thing to do. So we'll be focusing on that. There are a list of applications that you can use with the help of Python. Out of this, we'll be, we'll be focusing most on these scientific and numeric applications. That is going to be our chunk of machine learning applications. And once we have like an idea about that, we'll be focusing on video-based applications, which is going to be our part of computer vision-based applications. And ultimately, if we have time, we'll be going through application of for images, and which is going to be our basic image processing or image classification chain. I mean, chunk of our course. That's about it. Then we'll be seeing about installation. What is installation of Python like? And how do you actually use Python? So I hope you guys have all installed Python. Is there anyone who has not installed Python? Yes, raise your hand. If nobody raises their hand, I'll just skip the installation part. And then when I share the PPTs, if you have any doubt, you can ask me. Okay, I'm assuming there are many hands raised. So much uh, there is to installing Python. Okay, you guys can lower your hands now. Okay, I'll just, I'll just quickly run through the installation. So by default, what happens is when you have a Jupyter, I mean, when you have Linux or when you have Ubuntu, I mean, or, or we have Mac OS, you have like um, these, all these Apple-based OSs, and by default that has Python pre-installed. So you don't have to go about learning, I mean, to install Python in those cases, but who are you using Windows? For them, this is a very important step to do, which is installation of Python. So for installing Python, you have to first go about the website called python.org. It's just a, it's very, very um, home page of Python Foundation. And that you just have to pick, I mean, put downloads. And you have to download the 3.9.1 version, because that is what we are going to use in our course throughout. So once you have this Python 3.1 installed version downloaded, which is a exe file. Then you have to run a exe file on your, I mean, on your um any downloads folder or whatever folder you have saved Python in. And once that is done, you have to, you'll, you'll be having an installer command coming up, which is going to be like a run installer based thing. That once that is done, you'll have to click on install now, and then we will be having a surface like this. So once you have install uh, the exe running of Windows, you will be having this installed installer running up. In, in that, you have to install this and you'll have to also in, include IDLA, which is going to be your environment or your interpreter of using Python for the very first time. Then you have to install IDLA also and then you have to give the add Python 3.9 to path also. So make sure you do this also. Add Python 3.9 to path. If you don't, you'll be having a lot of these troubles when you are actually going to use Python for your projects. So this is a very important step that you have to add python to path you have to add python to path you have to click this tick box when that is done, your job is done you have to then only wait until the progress is running and once you have the progress done you'll be getting the setup a successful command and then you can close and you can start python with the help of this ideally from your start menu once you have that ideally set up you can just go about uh starting the id so up until here i can see two hands are raised um are these issues about Installation of Python. If it is not about installation, you can just lower your hand. If it is about installation, you can go forward and ask it out. Yes, Hema Priya, you have some doubt? I'll unmute you. You can ask it out. Sir, I am unable to see your screen, sir. Only PPT is present. Yeah, so that's what I mean. Um, showing you the, the installation from the PPT. If I go forward and install it right away, 
it might be taking too much time so you get the ppt of installation thing can you see the runner code in python slide yeah himapriya can you see my runner code in python slide hopefully this was i mean uh, you are able to view the site no yeah. sir i am just uh, it's just only ppt is appearing of uh, data science internship syllabus okay is that something okay let me share it again then okay is it visible now did you see the screen now able to see the setup screen himapriya yes right yes sir yes sir okay all right sir Thank can you. you please repeat it once again yeah, yeah i'll just go through the installation once again okay sir okay and yeah that's nice to hear that you are actually able to like see the screen now yeah i'll just go through it again and sandeep in the meantime you have the same doubt sandeep i'm just unmuting you you can ask your doubt do you sandeep i'm thinking he might have forgotten okay so i'll just again just come back to the installation once again so once you are in i mean um on this python.org which is a python organization site you can just go to downloads once you go to downloads you just have to download the installation file that is going to be a exe file that you can just go through once you are on the site so let's click this slide so once you have we come into this slide okay and here you see it's a python 3.212.1 version which is the latest version we'll be going to this 3.9 version and installing that so you have to click this pp and from there you only have to download this You can do it under any other version you have. If you have downloaded that, you'll be able to view this. I just again have to. And see in the top, I have this, this downloads button. And from there, I will download the pip file, the exe file. Then, then we'll have this, this AMD vision which is going to be this and then again just uh, install now once you have done that you can just go forward and uh, have the progress done so i hope you are able to see this now once you have done this you just have to install python again like i was showing then you have the same prompt that i that i did now you can do it yourself and the install now and just add it to the path and again your installation should be starting and once you have done that your setup will be successful after you're done it. Then nothing, you just have to close the Python shell and start the IDLE. There's nothing difficult that you cannot do by yourself. So I hope you guys can just follow it by yourself. And if you have any doubts with regards to installation or adding to the path, you can ask me. And if there's no doubts, I mean, it's well and good. Then we can start with the starting of IDLE, which is basically your interactive development learning environment. This is where you write the first set of programs before you actually move on to using higher level IDLE programs. So this is going to be a place where you're actually going to do a lot of your like uh, playgrounding or like your initial programs that you're going to use. Those all things can be used from the IDLE. So it's I mean, just a framework of how you actually go about starting a basic Python file. So you just to create a new file, go on to writing a save file, you just print hello world and your program will run once it is saved. Once it, is, once it is done, you'll be seeing a prompt which is going to show hello world in respect to your 
print hello world command and so these are a list of ideas that you're going to use so these are anything but interactive development environment that are going to be your your set of um, application that you're going to use for each and every program so for our use case we'll be using this spider python module which is going to be your best id for data science so which is going to be our choice of environment for working on our data science or applications we're going to use machine learning so apart from that there are all these different kinds of ids you might have used some of them you might be familiar with some of them a lot of these guys may be already using vs code or something like that you can carry on using that for the preference of using um, data science based application we'll be using spider because it is most industry used so we come into that and using that now with respect to actually going about learning how to install anaconda how to use this on different kinds of Ana jupyter notebooks we'll just be seeing how to install um anaconda and how do you actually go about learning to use spider on windows 10 so for that i mean i'll just either run you through the video once and see how those applications are actually worked is that fine is i am able to hear i just come back to this or else we just come to this once we are able to install this i mean anaconda by yourself so the process of doing that is just simple we'll be just coming to anaconda browser wait a second I'll be first running you to the practical installation and if you're able to uh, do it after going home or like after you are done with the session, you can try it yourself. If you're not able to see, we'll be coming back tomorrow and seeing how these applications are installed in through the video. So how do you actually go about Anaconda? You just go to anaconda.org and you download from here. So with the help of this download, Anaconda will start downloading. You see here, Anaconda has started downloading. Okay, so I'm seeing Anaconda is installing here. Once you have Anaconda installed, what is going to happen is, once Anaconda is installed, you'll be able to see like a prompt, which is Anaconda based environment. And after you've installed the environment, you'll be installing something called a spider. We'll be coming to that soon once we are installed. I mean, once we have it installed. In the meantime, we'll be coming to what is programming in general. What are different kinds of programming? So, in general, like just to have like a brief introduction about your different application on what an account. I mean, what these different programming concepts are. In general, programming is of two types, which is basically object-oriented programming and process-oriented programming. They also have a process-oriented programming. So let's imagine this like a, a very common example. So when you refer to object-oriented programming, the idea is that um, let's say if you want to create a circle, if you want to draw a circle, what do you do? Just use a, you use a rounder and you draw a circle with it. But let's say if you want to draw 100 circles, so for drawing 100 circles, you cannot just go about, I mean, using a uh, rounder each and every time. What you can do essentially, is that you'll just, I mean, if they are of identical size, then you'll just draw the circle once. And then based on that circle, you just uh, just pick up that circle blueprint and paste it again and draw it as an outline. So what that means is that for using, uh, like for drawing one circle, you can just draw use a process, which is you, you take a rounder and you put a rounder circle. But for using like a, this thing at scale, when you want to use this for, like industry level application, you cannot just use rounder each and every time and take it there. So that what you do is basically you have a die or which, which you have a mold and you take that mold, you take it, you plot it on the uh, graph paper and then you circle it around so that it, it, it all gets plugged out. So the idea is that once you want to have something done for one or two times for trial basis, you can use a process or like a procedure. Otherwise what you can do is actually go about using a object-oriented approach. We come into them in detail when we learn about object programming. But for now, just to give you an idea about what it is, I just give you an example of it's drawing a circle. We will be coming back to it tomorrow when we have more idea and more time about focusing on this object oriented programming. So these are two different kinds of programming, which is a procedure oriented programming, which is the older sake of use of programming, where we use 
when we used to create like this hall, I mean, full of computers and on that hall itself, we were using this only for purposes like calculation. We will come into that also, but for the now, the languages like C and all the languages before C, which is using assembly, using Fortran, using Prolog, all of those languages for which we're using like on, um, like on very old and uh, like computers were all basically used for simulated programming. But nowadays, which languages which, which are using today's maybe like Python, JavaScript, Ruby, all of those languages are basically optimized for object-oriented programming. So Java is a perfectly object-oriented programming in that you cannot use procedure, you cannot have functions without actually defining uh, classes and actually using this uh, object for those classes. So Java is a perfectly object-oriented programming, whereas Python can support both object-oriented programming as well as procedure-oriented programming. So that is a very flexible nature of Python for allowing simpler projects using procedure-oriented programming and more complex and industry projects with the help of object-oriented programming. That's what we'll be seeing and the difference. We'll be coming back to this again again tomorrow when we come uh, into more detail about object-oriented programming. Today we'll be focusing more on the syntax and semantics. Up until if any doubt, you can ask me now. I see someone raising their hand, so I'll just ask them to unmute. Yes, I suppose there's no doubt. So yeah, I'll just start with the Python first program. You guys must be aware of this. How do you write your first hello world program? So you just have like print a hello world syntax. Once you have that, you'll be getting an output regardless of what you put in. If you put in an inverted comma, you'll be having only inverted commas. If you put in a semicolon, you'll be having only semicolon. So Python just does not care about the string as long as it is supported by double strings or like single string also. So I'll just call this part of declaration as a statement. So statements are nothing but like assignment or basically when you have like statement like, okay, um, this when you speak also, what you say is a statement unless you are actually having a question or a like a interrogation. So all of your communication happens with the help of statements. So statement basically is that you are assigning something to it. So let's say if I'm assigning a to the value one, that a equals to one becomes a statement. Similarly, all of the different kinds of loops or basically your conditions that if, else, or for, while, all of those are nothing but statements that are going to use your Python functions which are for and if and while to go about creating different kinds of loops or different kinds of condition as and when you require them to use. All right. So this is what you are using Python statements for. And we'll be coming to the multiple line statements also. So if you're able to see my screen, what's happening here is I'm using the statement um, s equals to one plus two plus three up until nine. But what is continuation character? Basically what this does is, even after I, lay, I leave the line, it is not going to terminate this because it is going to have a continuation operator. So this will be adding up until one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine with the help of this conditional or this continuation character. Then what we come into C is, we'll be having, we're going to see next is how you actually use declaration for using board mass. So all of you guys must have learned board mass in your past classes. Nothing, nothing but bracket of division, multiplication, addition, subtraction. So what I'm doing here is I'm giving a variable, which is uh, I'm assigning a variable name n. And I'm trying to use board mass into it. So basically first what I do is I'll be having a bracket. So the bracket will be completed first. If I have a plus sign after that, this plus sign will be only used after the bracket is done. So in the bracket, there is first product and board mass also you have bracket of division multiplication. There's no division over here. So it will multiply here. So one multiplied by two multiplied by three is going to be six. It is going to be a product of a B, um, two, three and one. Then what I have after M is A. So I'll, in board mass, I have A, which is addition. So 6 plus 7 is 13. 13 plus 8 is 21. 21 plus 9, 30. So the final value of N is going to be 30. That's uh, the whole point of using board mass. Then what I use, I'm showing you about what a declaration statement using list. So these are nothing but examples of multiple line statement that we saw in the last slide. So what I'm doing here is footballer is basically a variable that is going to be a list data type. And that list is going to store your three uh, popular footballers 
that is going to be Messi, Neymar, and Suarez. All of these separated by the help of your uh, list termination or commas. It is in the detail, but this is just for understanding what are multiple end statements. I'm showing you these examples. And this is what basically we call to as referred to as a, a curly based list, or basically what you can see in the next cases we will be seeing is this is going to be a set. Excuse me. Yeah. And after that, it's said we'll be having to use semicolons. So this is like a, in if, different languages to see. In C and C++, this is a mistake because you can't use multiple semicolons in the same statement. In the case of Python, the semicolons are used for multi, assigning the same multiple variables in the same line. So this use I means so this um, in Python is used done by with the help of using multiple semicolons in the same line. This is about using multiple statements. Now we'll come to what is indentation. So if any of you guys have worked in other languages, you must have seen like in JavaScript or in even Java, there's a lot of these multiple braces. There are a lot of these brackets that you have to do. So if you're, let's say, creating a function in JavaScript, in that function of JavaScript, you have to first open a bracket when you're starting the function and then close the bracket when you're closing the function. So that makes it very difficult to read because Let's say you have a function opening up here. Let's say I'm calling a function. Void. It is not, it is not giving any output. It is having a function called main. It's a main function I'm only adding in for, for simplicity. So this function is basically going to add A plus B. to take the value of a plus b is going to create a variable which is going to be c and c value is going to be equal to the addition of a and b so i i want to return c but actually i mean if i want to terminate this and return c i'll close this over here but after closing this also i have to close these brackets so this bracket let's say this is only a simple function that is it's only having a simple bracket let's say if it is a nested function if i add right to add inheritance into this I have to have a list of brackets that I have to keep a track of for being just able to not make a query and not make an error of this uh, syntax of JavaScript. So in order to avoid this in Python, what do we have is basically a concept of indentation that you forget all of this, uh, this indent of this uh, rubbish of creating these brackets and storing these bracket values. What we essentially only have to do is take care of only only one thing that we are basically using the lines that are going to be used for that function. So if let's say I'm creating a function sum, I only have to leave, leave four uh, spaces after using this in the function add call. And then if I use this four lines, if I just leave this four set of uh, spaces, I can use this print five is greater than two as a statement inside this. What this signifies is that if five is, this is a conditional statement or this is a conditional line that is going to represent if five is greater than two, if it follows this, if it is a part of this, conditional statement, then it is going to have four spaces before it's going to start. So if after five uh, is greater than two, if this is true, then I leave four line, four spaces and then print five is greater than two. That is going to be my indentation or it is going to be my set of idea that is going to be stored that okay, okay, after this conditional statement, this is this part is going to be executed. And if this is not true, then it is going to have an else statement. So the, the four spaces are nothing but representing indentation. That is what about indentation is. Then we come to comments. So comments are basically your lines of code that you don't want to use, that you don't want the interpreter to execute. So basically this is going to be for any other purposes. Like let's say you want to store some um, output that you want to have for your team to see, or you want to store some guidance or some, some let's say explanation for your code. All of those have to be done with the help of these comments. These comments are nothing but your this print hello world is basically this going to be this this comment is basically going to like be a test comment. Then this if you want to have some changes to your code that you're not sure that is going to work or not, then that changes up until they're finalized. You can keep the earlier part of the code under the comments so that they are not executed, and you can have also the Python uh, code ready before you can if they have 
pre if the later code is not working so this is going to be like a, a comment is going to be like a safety for you to check your new code if you want to use multiple line comments then there are two ideas of doing it first way is to use um line I mean, like a hashtag comment for each and every line or what is a better way to do that the better way is to have this triple code so single and double quotes are used for strings and basically storing uh, python values but the triple quotes are basically used finally for storing multiple line comments or basically what we refer to as inline comments okay that is what we are referring to as inline comments so these inline comments or triple quotes are basically going to store your comments over multiple lines that is very easy to do with the help of python now we'll be coming to our different kinds of keywords we'll be seeing each of them keywords in detail so this keyword are nothing but a kind of special words that are that are functions that are performing some special actions in python so the and keyword as you know is like a logical operator that is i mean if five is greater than two and three then it is going to print let's say five is greater than two and three then in that case we'll be having the and operator which is going to be like a um inter like a and operator like we have in logic gates same way and similarly the uh, all operator is going to be like a union is going to be an intersection operator all right then you have the as operator which will be seeing in the future time when we use um this exceptional handling similarly the assert is also used in exceptional handling then break will be seeing when we learn about control flow statements up until i mean in the next class then we'll be seeing what are classes when we'll, we'll, when we'll come to what is written to programming the continue part of it again will be seeing when we are learning about loops then all of these functions like definition or like when you are creating function therefore def function is basically that if it basically used for creating functions so we'll be coming through all of these different kinds of um keywords when we are coming in detail about each of the concepts so by the time we are done with the sessions we'll be having clear crystal idea about what are the different kinds of functions and keywords going to use In the future, also we'll be coming to a lot of these different kinds of modules that we're going to use. So we're using this um, pandas, numpy, or let's say TensorFlow. All of these libraries are basically going to be like imported into our pipeline with the help of this import keyword. Similarly, for checking the string, we have the check string, which is going to be an in operator. Then we'll be coming to um, like what is the IES, or basically what is it, a variable alias operator then with the help of is is operator then the function that we'll see the function is done with the help of lambda like if you want to create an inline function that a single line of code can be used to create multiple functions that is in with the help of lambda or creating like a anonymous function with the help of that then it will be coming to what is none what is i mean uh different kinds of like zero or non null based operation will be coming to that then what are these different kinds of law? I mean, another logic operator is apart from and. So and has one operator, or is another operator is going to be either or. It is also going to be a negative or or a nor operator, which is going to be like a not based keyword. That is going to be a logical operator as well. We come into that as well. Then what is a pass keyword? How do you actually run or bypass some statement in the execution flow? That is what we'll be seeing. Again, raise part will again come towards with try, accept, and raise, and finally, finally, it will be coming in the exception handling part again. Then we'll be seeing the different kinds of loops with the help of while and all. We'll be coming to that as well. So before that, we'll be seeing what are identifiers. So identifier are just like keywords, special keywords, but they are having some specific value. That is class. When you use a class keyword, and that class keyword becomes a identifier that okay. What I'm going to do after this is going to be creating a class. And similarly, if I'm going to talk about create a function, that function, that function is going to be is going to be uh, preceded by a keyword called def. That def keyword is being basically referred to as an identifier for creating function. This is what identifier means. This is not something very very and I mean like that where we have to pay attention to but what it does it basically is that i mean in python identifiers are differently named for different variables so if i i mean since python is a case sensitive language 
So a variable named manpower, which is having M capital and a variable named manpower, which is having a small M. Both of those are very different in terms of their variable storage and in terms of their variable um, implementation. Also, when you print a manpower with a capital M, if it is not variable, it is not already defined. It is going to throw an error at you. Okay, these are invalid syntax because variable reference before it is defined. But simply, if you have a manpower variable with a small m defined, it will not be running into an error. That's the whole point of using case sensitivity in Python. Then we'll come to data types, which is basically very simple from data types, which are called variables. So variables are nothing but empty objects. Let's say if I want to store water, I'll be using an object called bottle. So the whole point of using a bottle is to store water. Similarly, if I want to store somebody's name, let's say if I want to store my name as Rudra, then I can store this name. If I want to display it on, on my Zoom card, I can display it only and only if I have it stored somewhere, right? So that storage purpose is done with the help of variable. So the variables are nothing but storage blocks that are going to store something. So those variables can be storing either a string, which is basically your name, or your age, which is basically your number, or integer, which is basically your um, age, okay? Or it can be storing your information that, okay, let's say my name is Rudra. My first name is Rudra, but what is my last name? If I want to store both of these say, separately, like Rudra and Joshi separately, then I can use this um, variable called list to store that. Similarly, if I want to store my address, that Rudra and this address is, let's say, um, Sinisha Dwarka 1, Hyderabad, Telangana. That address becomes a part of my value. Okay, so my name, which is a key, Rudra is a key. And the value that is referencing is the address that is basically Sinidha Dwarka 1, Hyderabad, Telangana. That becomes my value. And this is stored with the help of a variable called dictionary. We'll be coming to that as well. But for now, just the fact that we can use this uh, variables to store um, integer, strings, list, dictionary. And if you want to have like an immutable kind of a storage that we cannot even permanently delete anytime, but you cannot even change that is basically referred to using tuples. Now, when we saw statements, we basically a equals to one, b equals to two. Those assignment operators are basically what is mentioned with the help of these statements. So this x is equal to four is where I'm assigning the value four to the variable x, which is a integer. The next time assigning the value of ram to the variable x again, which is a string. I print them, the variable is going to print out the respective values with this with data types. Then we'll come into how you actually use multiple assignment. So by default, Python has a single assignment. So basically a is equal to one if you type. It's only the value of a which is equal to one. Then if you want to store the value of two, then you have to create another variable. But if I have this, all the three variables, a, b and c, so in the same value 100, I can then store them in the same line with the help of this multiple assignment, which is the help of multiple equal to's. So A equal to B equal to C is going to store the value of um, both. All the three variables will be having to store the value of 100 itself. The next, if I want to store the whole thing into, into different variables altogether, so what I'm doing is A equal to B equal to C is all storing the value of 1, 2 and RAM. It basically is going to be helpful to create multiple variables in the same line, but I don't want my code to elaborate as much as possible. This is going to be your idea of how do you actually go about creating multiple assignments. This is how you print out types. Then this is a single I mean, Python by, gen, by definition is a simple programming language. So it does not have any definition. It doesn't have any difficulties when you call it via, via variable with the help of single quotes or double quotes, as long as the value, uh, the value of the variable is same about the best case in duty of python then output which is basically print function or def or like a uh, display function all of those are basically referred to as the output function that is going to store your values and display it for your response up until here if you have any doubts you can ask me now i see somebody raise their hand In case there is no doubt, we can just move forward to the data types. Is there any doubt?
yes yes user, you have any doubt username um a0577 okay i'm assuming there's no doubt so let's move on with um what are data types in python in general so there are frequently like there are um essentially five data types in python which is uh, numbers strings list tuples and dictionaries now based on these numbers and all of these data types have sub data types basically in them which are going to be like the subdivisions of those data types so in the case of numbers they'll be storing numbers with the help of either integer or it can be their long numbers can be float or complex numbers so integers are basically going to be your simpler values from 0 to plus infinity and minus 0 to minus infinity those values are going to be stored with the help of integer then for storing all the complex values or which is your values you have like which are, which are very large values like let's say your date if you store a date sometimes if you store a mobile number what happens sometimes in excel is that it by default interprets those values with the help of long keywords basically by default your date or your mobile number gets stored into a format which is going to be like a five nine or something like having and ultimately uh, like some long integer as the input that is stored with the help of long data type then when you have some decimal points let's say a value of your weight that, that can be a float data type which can be stored with the help of float keyword and finally if you're storing some complex value like value of pi or the value of let's say vector data all of those can be stored with the help of complex data type so then we'll be coming to after uh, integers will be coming to strings which is basically your text a string can be stored with the help of string data types which is what we saw here so when you store the string str is equal to hello world it's basically that you're storing your um a uh, text which is going to refer to as hello comma or space word and store this when you print this you basically have the whole output coming out hello world if you print with the help of index which is basically your zero is basically nothing but an index out here and that index is basically going to only print the part that is going to be selected out here in the index so this indexing happens to only print out the edge part which is the first part the indexing starts from the zero part and it goes all the way to the last digit which is the 11 out here so this is 0 1 2 up until this 11 which is going to be last index now this is a positive indexing from the right to left from left to right but if you want to move from the left to right then if you want to see this exclamation mark then this by default has the positive index of 11 but when you move towards left from the right side this index is basically of exclamation mark starts from minus one so the my so the last index is basically minus one and the first index that comes up until here is going to be minus 12. so the negative indexing starts from right to left and the positive indexing starts from left to right this is basically about indexing now if you see about concatenation after you have the string printed if you want to add let's say a value to it let's say if test is what you want to add after your hello world then you just increment that with the help of the plus sign and you pass in the type which is going to print the test is a string since the type is matching the string str and the test string are both strings that that means that they can be added together with the help of concatenation and that just prints the hello, hello world test as an output then what we're doing is we're having the string length the string length is basically the length function that is going to print out the length of the whole string and predicting i mean what are the total number of digit, digits that you have in this string based on that you will be having an output of 12 out here because the hello space comma world is going to have 12 characters in it so it will be going to store 12 bytes of data in the variable a and so the length of variable a is going to be 12 now what you have seen in the keywords is basically your n there was a keyword this in keyword is basically a check string keyword so this keyword is going to check if your value of string that you are passing in the double quotes is it present in the text string or not so in the txt string what we have here is the best things in life are freedom so if you want to check that basically if your freedom keyword is it present or not in the whole txt string then that can be done with the help of your txt if you want to find and you will be using freedom in it's basically your integration or your check string operator is it present in the freedom 
text or not if yes it will print one that is true if no it will be printing false so this is a boolean operator that basically it is going to print out either a zero or a one nothing between the and in between so there is no no by not a uh, subjective operation this is all going to be objective or basically going to be having the storage of only and only true and false similarly if, if not basically it's going to show you the value of what negative operator is so if i want to ask you someone just raise your hand to answer this so by default if we saw in the previous example in is basically checks in it checks basically if uh, freedom is present or not if it is present it will be taking it true similarly just i am asking you a question and i want answer if you want to answer just raise your hand just people who think that the output of this is going to be yes hands down people who all think that the answer to this print statement is going to be false please raise your hand that check if expensive is not in present in the following text raise your hand whoever believes that this answer of txt the best thing in life of freedom and print expensive not in text is going to have a response of false just raise your hand yes manoj already thinks it's uh, false so yeah manoj just uh, help me understand why do you think it's going to be a false response yeah manoj yeah so he has i mean uh lowered his hand if himashri think you think that is going to be a false you please explain yourself so this basically so because it is not there in the text form yeah it is so, there in the text it can be true okay so you are saying the text string is basically having the key and the string that is best thing in life or freedom now since expensive is not in the is not present in the whole string hence it should be giving an output that is false but since we are not using in in this we are using not in that is basically you are having double negative that is is expensive there or not it is not there right if if i were to see that if expensive is there in text that will be having a false response agreed but since it is having not so expensive not expensive is not there right but if it is having a not in that is basically a double negation hence it will be having true because it's already not there in the string right if in place of this if i had freedom let's say if freedom is not in text then would have been the what would have been the answer yes if i had freedom not in text instead of um this thing what would have been the answer yes it is free please unmute yourself if i were to ask you chalo theek hai i'll just answer for myself if uh, i were to ask you if x if freedom is there or not there in the uh, string if it is there i would have gotten true but if it was not have been there it would have gotten false now similarly since expensive is already not there in the string hence expensive in text would have given me a false but since expensive not in text is there hence i would getting a true response for this understood in case there is someone who is not clear with this you can just raise your hand after the lecture and i'll clear this out for you but i hope everybody got the catch in this and got an idea of what is the string check is then we'll be coming to this string formatting there are multiple ways of formatting string that is basically you are printing the value of your variable whatever is the string is there and then after that you are able to trying to format or basically add something that is going to dynamically edit your code there are multiple ways of doing that but the most efficient way of doing that is with the help of this dot format keyword that if i want to have let's say i am storing my ordering some food item 
And if I want to store the value, it's okay. My order is I want last pieces of item uh, one for dollar x. Then for creating uh, like a Python code for this, what I'll do it first, I'll store the value of this quantity, item number and price. And after that, I'll be storing them in the variable. And I want to print that for duplicate values. If I want to have, let's say the value of quantity first, item number second and price third. After that, I'll just give them the values out here that I want to pay um, syntax right here. that I want to have dollars first. That is the, I want to have, since dollar is, the price value variable is mentioned second, this item number is first and quantity has the index zero. Hence, I want to pay index two, which is going to be price dollars for the quantity that is going to be the first variable pieces and of item, which is the item number, it's going to be a second variable. This is how you have a single string format and done. After that is a, all the different kinds of operators, like addition operator, repetition operator, slicing, what is range based slicing, all this will be seen practical when we move towards the coding part. Next, you come to different data types, which is basically a list. List, as you might already know, it is basically a collection of different data types, which is going to be either a very a, a, a string or another list, or maybe um, numbers or final can also have a tuples inside it. The whole point of having a list is that in strings, the fundamental unit of a string is a character, but the fundamental unit of a list is basically nothing but an item or a string ABCD is nothing but an item. Your 786 is nothing but an item. All the string elements are nothing but items. So the list is basically referred to as a collection of items. So here we have two lists, list one and list tiny list. So this is to have different values. And the same way that we saw with the string that we, we can print the list, you can print the string, you can have the index of the, the same way box for the list as well. So you can print the list, you can index the list with the help of this indexing. One, two, three will be based only the one, two, and three join part till here. And we can also add these two lists together with the help of concatenation. It's similar pretty much to what we saw in the case of string. So not waste much time on to this. So this by default, are what is important is the list comprehension. So we'll focus on that. So list comprehension basically is that you have you can either index uh, I mean the item and get the value out of there. So you can change the value of item with the help of this um, providing, I mean, I'm just giving the index of banana over here and I want to replace the value of banana with the help of black current. And I can just give in the pass in the index value and when I print this, I'll have black current instead of uh, banana in the first index and banana will be still there, but it will be pushed to the second index. That is how in, you change the value of item and you add a new item. So for inserting again, you have other more ways that is you can use the insert function or you can use the append function. If you pass in the insert function with the help of a, a range also, or like an index also, it will by default provide the index of orange instead of banana. But if you don't pass any, uh, you don't pass an index to it, then by default, it will put it in the end. And it's the same, if you want to extend the list towards the end, then the extend function is used for that. <coughs> So the extending with the help of string will only add an, one item to the list. But if you want to add a new list to the existing list, then you can use the this this list dot extend, which is going to extend the this list function and is going to add three more items to the this list. That's the whole point of using this this list extend function. Same like we added the functions. I mean we added the um items to the list we can also remove the items with the help of the remove keyword like we studied about the um uh, add keyword you also have the remove keyword if you want to if you saw about the extend keyword you also have the push and pop keyword the same function that they perform that, that is performed by the insert keyword for adding an item the same function is performed by the pop keyword for removing an item then if you want to remove the particular item permanently from the list, we can use the delete keyword. If you don't pass in the list detail or the index, then by default, it will delete the whole list from the variable. That was about list. Now we'll come to tuples, which is basically your immutable list. So the only point of difference between a list and a tuple is that 
lists can be mutable or the list values can be changed whereas the values of tuples once you've added the value of tuple you cannot change the values of tuples so they can be thought of only as read only list that's the whole point of tuples the comprehension is pretty much same apart from the fact that you cannot change the value of tuples so the function that we had like in so the value of changing the function of list so that can be done only in list you cannot do that same thing in the help of in with the help of tuples okay so yeah that was what i was trying to say that tuple i'm creating of same value has the list the values are same for the tuple and the list but I, in the case of list i can assign the second value of instead of 786 i can assign the value of 1000 to it but in the case of tuple i cannot change the value of 786 to 1000 because the function of tuple is that it is a immutable list or it is a read only list right? so i cannot change the value of any items inside the tuples no matter what i do the value of 786 is going to be 786 instead of 1000 and it cannot be changed immaterial or regardless of whatever i can do only thing i can do is i can just copy the tuple and i can change the value and i can have the value of uh, 7000 before i can assign it to the next tuple and finally we come to another last data type which is referred to as a dictionary so dictionaries are basically going to be your key value storage that is earlier i gave an example that if i want to store my name that is rudra and i want to store apart from my name i want to store the address or my age also I can do that by having another key. So dictionary is a nothing but key value pairs storage that is going to store your value with the identification of your key. So you can call your, uh, if you want to open your lock of your door, you can only open that if you have the key with you, right? So the whole point of dictionary is that you need to, you can only get the access to your data, which is going to be your value only and only if you have the access to your key. That is the whole point of dictionary. So like we saw in list if you want to remove or any add an item in the list you can do that with the help of like adding an item so similarly i can add the item uh, with the help of dictionary by adding and only assigning a new um, material over here is going to be your um new key and you can append and you can also change the value of it that is the point about updating this is very self-explanatory when you see the slides and you can go through it directly the only point to remember is that if you use the delete keyword here i mean without giving the key name you will end up deleting the whole dictionary and that might end up using a lot of your data so this particular dictionary data type is used when we use a lot of these apis or is application development interfaces so the whole point of using this API is that, I mean, uh, you can be able to transfer the data in real time. So if I just, I'm going to share a uh, poll right now. I want all of you guys to answer this. Are you able to see the poll? Yeah, you can see all of you guys giving the right answer. There are still some guys who are just having fun with me and writing wrong answers intentionally. All right, I'll just end the poll in like 10 more seconds. Okay, I'll just close the poll now. So share the result now. Okay, I hope all of you got your answers. So now after this, we'll just again come back to your
Yes. Then yeah. after this, uh, what we're going to do is, I mean, I told you about right dictionary. Basically, if you delete the whole uh, dictionary, if you have a delete, de you don't pass in the key, it will end up deleting your whole dictionary. It will be very useful and very like useless when you're actually using that in real time data because it will wipe out all of your data when you're, I mean, showing some data in the value of dictionary. So with this, this is a, it's just a, a recollection of what we had done today. That is, your list is basically a list of collection of items. It allows you to pick at entries. Then tuples is basically an order or like a read-only list. Then sets is basically what we saw, like a, a tuples basically, is to, I mean, storing these immutable values. And dictionaries are finally going to be your key value pair storage. So with that, we come to an end of today's lecture. I'll just pass in some questions so that you guys can be able to retrieve what we had sent, what we have learned today. So just pass in some polls in the last couple of minutes and you can answer them. I'm sharing the poll. You can answer this based on your understanding. Just wait half a minute for each of you to answer and then the next 30 seconds, I'll just close the poll again. Right, I just close the poll in like next 15 seconds. Right, I'll just end the poll now, move towards the next question. That's in the next question. So you guys are really smart. Yeah, all of you guys are seeing the same answer. Click here and finally we'll move to the yeah, second last question. Yeah, send the question. You can just Try it out yourself. All right, I just cancel this in and I'll end the poll in like five seconds. Three, four, five, yeah. The last question. Right. So with that, we come to the end of the poll and then the end of the today's session. If you have any doubts, you can ask me right now. If you don't, you can just conclude and you can drop off in case you have no doubts. If you have any doubts, you can just stay back and ask me doubt and I'll be happy to clear them. All right. Yeah.
थैंक यू सो मच गाइस थैंक यू फॉर योर पार्टिसिपेशन थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू या जोनाथन इज रेजिंग द हैंड जोनाथन टेल मी सर व्हाट इज द डिफरेंस बिटवीन जुपिटर नोटबुक एंड स्पाइडर सर सो द होल पॉइंट ऑफ यूजिंग जुपिटर नोटबुक इज बेसिकली दैट वी डोंट वांट टू राइट कोड एंड रिप एंड रब द कोड अगेन एंड गेट इन द न्यू फाइल Jupyter notebook is basically like giving you a laptop. I mean, like a notebook kind of feel. That okay, you can just flip your page and you can start writing your code again on the next page, and you can see the output right away. Whereas, I mean, um, Spider is basically a just simple ID like you have in um your um your Python VS code also. So the whole point of using Jupyter notebook is when you want to create using these plots or these dashboards, or when you want want to see the whole output that is colorful, and you want to have that. Pictureized or visualized in your code. I mean, based on your uh, code's output, you can use Jupyter Notebook. When you don't want that, if you want to only process the code and see how it works, so that we use the Jupyter. I mean, Spider. Both of them are similar in terms of their distribution. All of them are coming from the same Anaconda-based distribution. So the only difference is that we use Jupyter Notebook for data uh, visualization and data modeling, and we use Spider for Machine learning because in the case of Spider, what we have is that we can see the whole data frame or the whole variable in front of us like a list. That's what makes the difference between Jupyter Notebook and uh, Spider. I hope you have answered your question. Is there anything else, sir? Why can't we use instead of Anaconda VS Code, sir? VS Code is not a dist is not a difference. Uh, of like it's not a different uh, than Anaconda. VS Code is basically um. Like an ID itself, VS Code. I mean, it's an ID, whereas Anaconda is a distribution. Or you can understand Anaconda like a environment, or basically like a OS that you can use for creating machine learning. So you can use VS Code, not a problem. You can use Anaconda based Spider ID, not a problem. Whatever you are comfortable with, you can use. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jonathan. Yeah, Himapriya, you seem to have some doubt. Others Sir, can drop off, please. I mean, it's like already eight thirty. You guys might have your dinner. So we'll have daily sessions or uh, day by day, sir. It's every alternate day. So today you have one, and then Saturday you might have another one. So it's every alternate days you can be like uh, having okay, a day break sir. in the between. Okay, sir. Will you share the PPT, sir? Absolutely, yeah. I'll share the PPTs with you guys. Okay, thank you. Sir. Okay. Yeah, I think. Thank you, Mpia. All right. Anybody else has a doubt? If not, you can just conclude and you can go and have a dinner. Yeah, Tejashree, you have seemed to have some doubt. Tell me. Tejashree, I'm asking you to unmute. You can just um, unmute and ask me. Seems like you have some problem unmuting. If you you have some doubt, you can just write it in the uh, chat box, and I'll see that and respond. Yeah, I hope you have um written in the chat box if you have some doubt. I'm asking you to unmute repeatedly, but you're not able to unmute. I guess you can just type in the chat box in case you have something concerning doubt. Yeah. Hello, Rohan. Did you see you were you were able to unmute? Yeah, you can now unmute and ask. Yeah, yeah. Did you see? Tell me. Sir, could you please tell us those answers of those questions? Oh, in the polls. I mean, the polls were pretty self-evident. I would have already shared the results with you guys. So the answer is nothing specific. So like Python, which is a, not a framework. The first answer is of course React. React is a not a Python framework. It's a JavaScript-oriented framework. Whereas Flask and Django are both React, I mean, are both Python-oriented framework. 
Next question is what is the not a fun I mean not a front end technology. Yeah, that's Linux, of course, because HTML, CSS are all both front end based yes, app frameworks, UI frameworks. And what is API a short form for? So API is a short form for, of course, application programming interface. I told you in the lecture itself. And yes, last sir. question: What is the um, what is what is not a front end? I mean, uh, web frameworks, of course. Python is not a framework, it's a programming language. So it's, of course, uh, not a framework. So front and back end are, of course, frameworks and basically types of frameworks. But Python is not a framework, it's a programming language. So that's what the answer is. So those are all the questions okay, that sir, have been asked. You. Okay, is that all? Thank you. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes. All right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you can drop off. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Yes, so we can all conclude the today's session and we'll be meeting the same time, 6.30. Just make sure you guys are coming a little early. I'll be there by 6.20. I want you guys there by 6.20 as well so that we can sharp the lecture sharp by 6.25. All right? Yeah. Is there any issue that somebody has? Uh, sir, uh, we, with the help of Streamlit, we can create a web page now, sir. Yeah, yeah, of course, you can use Streamlit. Uh, I mean, without box. HTML, CSS, we can go on only Streamlit only, no, sir? Yeah, yeah, because Streamlit is basically just another HTML rendering engine. So it will be having its own HTML rendering. You don't have to learn about HTML for using Streamlit. So without even HTML learning, you can go about using your Streamlit application. So what is the difference between Flask and Streamlit, sir? The point is that Flask is used for not only hosting machine learning application, Flask is also used as a full stack web development framework. So that is a very different use case. Flask is used for starting a web server, for creating this front-end application, for changing its backend, and for finally optimizing databases also. Whereas Streamlit is only for hosting a machine learning application. It's just another landing page for your application. Only a front-end. Sir, with the help of Streamlit, can we create backend also, sir? You can integrate your backend, but Streamlit does not allow you to have API connections. You cannot have your database integrated. You cannot change your database models like you can do in the help of Flask or Django. So the point yes. is that like Streamlit is only used for like prototype levels. That is basically when you only have to have some front end of your machine learning application, you can use Streamlit. Otherwise, you can use Flask for your small scale application. And if you have a larger scale application, you can use Django, of course, for your like any of your higher demands. Yes. Sir. Okay. Anything else? No, sir. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. I hope you guys enjoyed today's session. We'll be meeting soon on Saturday. And then we'll be discussing about functions and other OOPS concepts. So be prepared with your understanding of OOPS and what we'll discuss today. We'll be meeting on Saturday. Yeah. Hari Lakshmi, you have seemed to have some doubt. Yes, sir. Sir, mm -hmm. instead of remove function, we use the pop method, right? Uh, as same as append function, we use the action method. Why can't you use the list concatenation method? For adding two lists, is that what you're saying? Sir, instead of the remove function, we use the pop method, right? Yeah. Yeah, instead of append function, we use the method of action function. No. Instead of append no, no. function, why can't you use the list concatenation? You can use them in, but the for I mean the list concatenation will basically just add two lists together. Yeah. The question is, is yeah. Yeah. The question is, you want to use append function, and instead, instead of append of function, you want function. to yeah. yeah. But your question is basically supposed to be is that why can't I use list compre a list concatenation? Instead yeah. of extend function, because this concatenation is also adding two lists together and extend is also adding two lists together, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So the point here is that list concatenation will only add like your uh, one list and the other list without even like it will, what it will do it, it will alphabetically take your values and take it, I mean, a, and order it together. But the point is, I mean, extend function is also doing the same thing, but you have the, I mean, your this list when you are adding together, you have the freedom of either putting this tropical first or you can add it to this list. So there's no difference in that. You can do the same thing with the both the things. But here what you're doing is you're using a predefined function. Whereas there what you're doing is you're applying brute force or basically forcing your 
one list to accept and concatenate. So both of the things are right. Nothing wrong with any of them. Yes. The preferred way to do is, and the more programmable way to do is, is that you use an extend function because you cannot just add in like uh, yes. multiple um, sets of plus additions for adding a list comprehension. What you do basically is this: when you print this, you're creating a third list out of this. So, so you see, if I am printing this list plus tiny list, what I am adding up is I am getting a new list. Yes, sir. This is not even my tiny list and is not even my list. This is creating a new third variable. Whereas in the case of extend function, what is happening is I am able to get a same function itself. Now my same variable itself is going to store the values of both the uh, lists. Got it? Yeah. Yes, sir. I got That's it. That's the whole point of using extend. Okay, sir. Thank you. That's all right. Yeah. Okay. Then. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I hope you guys have all have your doubts cleared. If you have any more doubts, you can just ask me. Otherwise, we'll conclude now. Okay. So it's already 8.40 now. I hope you guys are hungry and you can go on for dinner. And we'll conclude today and we'll meet again back on 3rd Feb. It is a Saturday. Okay. Yes. Okay, I see Lokesh has raised the hand. Yes, tell me Lokesh. Sir, uh, attendance? Sir, about what about attendance? Attendance, all of you guys who have attended today's session will be giving them attendance. And whoever has missed out will be losing on attendance. Tomorrow onwards, on Monday, or Wednesday, I mean Saturday onwards, um, I'll be closing the gate or in the meeting by 6.25. I'll not be around anyone after 6.25. So make sure you guys are before 6.25. Okay? I'll be out my today's attendance or whatever people who have come. Okay? All right? Okay, sir. Okay, then. Just make sure you guys come tomorrow, I mean on Saturday, as early as possible by 6.20 itself. Okay? Anyway, you guys can go on and carry on with your dinner now. And we'll meet at uh, six twenty on Saturday, and then we'll continue from here. Yeah, hope you guys have a good night. Yeah, good night, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Yes, I'll, I'll end the meeting, Manasuni, right? So you can end the meeting. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time. We'll meet on Saturday again. Bye-bye. Good night.